thanks for joining me to talk about this really important topic. Um, we're going to jump into the article that was published in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Aging about hydro hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as a treatment for COVID-19. Um, so why don't we talk about this because it's getting a lot of attention. So we can start with you, you know, telling me a little bit about the study and what exactly the investigators were looking at here. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so just to kind of orient to the study. So this study included 36 patients who were SARS-CoV-2 positive. So these weren't necessarily infected patients. They were asymptomatic. A few of them were asymptomatic. Some had upper respiratory tract infections. Some had lower respiratory tract infections. And kind of the, the two groups in this study were 20 patients got hydroxychloroquine and 16 patients got standard of care. So just supportive management, no therapy that was actually directed toward the, toward the viral infections. And so what the authors were investigating was the impact of hydroxychloroquine and the dose that they gave in this analysis was 200 milligrams every eight hours. I think it's notable that this analysis actually isn't over yet. This is just some interim data. And really what they were looking at was the impact of this therapy on clinical outcomes, so things like clinical resolution, mortality and safety, and viral eradication. That's really what this publication focused on, just the viral eradication piece. And so that kind of came in two different buckets in this publication. One is just at their defined endpoint of six days, did the patients eradicate the virus? And then the second is kind of time to resolution or time to eradication. So was anything associated with quicker eradication as well? And so I think it's important for the audience to note that this study is still ongoing. Uh, they're still working on these data. They actually did not present any of the clinical data, but due to what they described their results as being so significant, they reported on interim data on eradication rates in these different patient groups. And so I think it's important to keep that context in place. Okay. So significant results sound like a good thing. Um, <laughs> so what, what exactly did the authors demonstrate? Yeah, we're definitely looking for significant something right now, right? No yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so really what they found was, so again, their time frame was a six day study time period. And so what they found was that on study day six, again, the last endpoint that they looked at in this analysis, 70% of patients who received hydroxychloroquine had a negative PCR, which means they eradicated the virus, at least per the test that was used in the study. Uh, so 70% of patients compared to only about 12% of patients who didn't get any therapy. So again, that was a, even though it was small numbers, that was actually a statistically significant finding. So that sounds good for the hydroxychloroquine, but what about the azithromycin? So yeah. where does that come in? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the title of the manuscript, right? It's hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. I think that this is where a lot of the debate and that's where a lot of the interest comes from. So again, remember, we're starting to talk about small subsets of small subsets of patients when we do this. But in their analysis, there were six patients that received azithromycin, and they described that for either treatment or for prophylaxis of bacterial infection. And so there was just this subgroup of hydroxychloroquine patients that also got azithromycin in combination. There was actually only six patients. However, at study day six, remember that was the, the, their primary endpoint that they were looking at, all six of those patients had cleared the virus from their nasopharyngeal sample, again, so they've eradicated the virus, compared to eight out of 14, or 57% of those who are on hydroxychloroquine alone. So again, even though you're starting to dice up small numbers, you saw this 100% versus 57%. So you can see why a lot of excitement came from that. In addition to that, there's a really nice figure in the manuscript, and I think that this is what really got people interested, that basically what they did is because they were getting daily swabs on these patients as they looked at eradication rates on day one, two, three, and so on and so forth. And what you can really see is that around day three is where you really start to see this apparent demarcation between monotherapy with hydroxychloroquine and then the combination from that standpoint. And so if these data hold true and if these data are accurate, um, that's a huge implication, right? You're eradicating virus, you, so a couple things with that, right? One, hopefully the patients will improve, although they did not look at clinical outcomes in the study. But in addition to that, I think it's important that there's potentially a bigger impact on the global spread of this. There's a lot of potential things that could be there. So that's why on the surface, that becomes a really important finding in this study. So 
final thoughts on this? Should patients be receiving this combination therapy then? Yeah, so uh, simply put, I mean, I, my answer would be no, but I, I think that I have to elaborate on that a little bit because although these data look good on the surface, I think there are a number of limitations to this data set that we need to talk about. Again, we have to be able to critically assess these data as they come out. So the first thing that I would comment on is that, so remember I said at the beginning that there was 20 patients in the hydroxychloroquine group and 16 patients who got standard of care. But if you actually look at the methods in the study, you'll see that there were actually 26 patients who got hydroxychloroquine. But because of the fact that in order to be accessible for this analysis, remember the primary thing was eradication at day six, in order to be accessible, they still had to be analyzable at day six. And there were actually six patients in the hydroxychloroquine group that dropped out of the study because they were no longer accessible. And I think it's important for viewers to note or the audience to note that if you actually look in the methods, these six patients, there were three of them that were taken out of the study because they decompensated and went to the ICU. Every single one of those patients was still PCR positive. There was one patient that passed away. He was actually PCR negative, but he passed away. There was one that went home who was actually PCR negative. And then one actually stopped due to nausea, a side effect from the hydroxychloroquine, who was still PCR positive as well. And so in my opinion, although I understand why the authors did what they did, at least five of these patients I would consider failures, right? You have patients going to the ICU, you have a patient that passes away, you have someone who had to stop due to an adverse event. And so if you think about the impact that could have, maybe remember when we started off and we said 70% versus 12%, that 70% would come down a little bit. It still might be a significant difference. And I ran the numbers, it still is a pretty nice difference, but I think it's important to note that that's one piece of the story. And the second piece related to that is, we don't know what of, which of those patients were on azithromycin, which weren't on it. And so whether that impacted the combo mono thing is really unclear. So that's one really important thing. The second one though, in my opinion, is much more important. And, and that's really getting down to the azithromycin finding, because this is what's gotten people really interested and excited. Um, and so I think to start off, kind of first and foremost with this, the, if, if you look at, there's a really nice table. One thing that I really like about the publication is there's, they, they really put the data out there for us to look at. Um, but if you look at, so right now we're no longer comparing to the control group. We're talking about the comparison between patients who got hydroxychloroquine monotherapy and those who got that combination. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, the first thing that jumps out is that there are some virological differences between the two groups. And let me explain what I mean by that. I won't get into numbers and cycle thresholds or anything like that because I, it, it's not gonna add a whole lot to this conversation. But bottom line, what you'll find is that patients in, there's a subset of patients in the hydroxychloroquine monotherapy group that had higher viral loads, okay? Mm -hmm. So more virus being present. So just logically, those patients would require more out of a drug therapy to be able to eradicate the organism in that situation, just from a logical standpoint. And so what happens is, and so when I look at these data and we assess these data, if you take out those patients who have higher viral loads and you try to make the monotherapy and combination therapy more on even terms, what you'll find is that the differences between the two completely go away. Hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine monotherapy does really well in that situation. So you'll see very similar eradication rates at day six, but even remember that we talked about before that we were looking at that time to clearance on day two, on day three, on day four, and so on and so forth, you'll see that they pretty much overlap. And so I think there's a huge limitation that the benefit of combo over mono might just be driven by differences between the patient population. And when you get rid of that, when you kind of limit it to like patients, again, at least from a virological standpoint, the difference goes away. So I think that viewers need to think about that and read and critically think through that process. And so when you see that type of a finding, then you have to kind of keep walking down that pathway, right? And so the next one is, would I expect 
azithromycin to help out in this situation. And bottom line is there's no evidence outside of this publication that would suggest that there's going to be some bang out of giving azithromycin to our patients. There's no in vitro data against any coronaviruses, let alone uh, SARS-CoV-2. There's no clinical data. There's no animal data. And it's really, when you start to walk through that process, it, in my opinion, it gets really hard to get to a logical place that azithromycin is playing a role here, especially when when you limit the study to like patients, there's absolutely no difference between the two groups. And so again, if you kind of keep walking that story through, not a real likelihood of benefit. And then you have to think, is there a risk if I give my patient both of these therapies in combination? And I would argue that there absolutely is. Both drugs can be associated with QT prolongation. And so if you give them both, that's an additive adverse event that you could see in a patient. So without a real good reason to think that there is a benefit, again, there's no other data that supports it. We talked about the limitations and what happens when you compare like therapies. It's my opinion that the risk, there's no rationale to give this combination right now, and the risk absolutely outweighs, outweighs the benefits. And so I think that that's an important thing to think of when you're assessing how to apply these findings to our patients. Now, there are a couple other limitations to this publication as well, related to the detection limits, related to the fact that the controls were at one site and they, they seem to be tested a little bit differently, whereas the actively treated patients were at a different site, very small numbers, and so really not a lot to go on there. And so I, I think that, in my opinion, there's, there's nothing in this study that really supports that combination therapy would be a good thing. That being said, despite all of that stuff we just talked about, if you take out the combination therapy piece of the story, I think the data are encouraging for hydroxychloroquine. Um, again, when you use those, those patients who didn't have that higher viral load, success rates in both arms are pretty good. Now, again, there are some limitations to these data too. They should not be taken as definitive. Again, remember, we're just talking about viral eradication at different time points. We don't know if there's a clinical meaning to that. We don't know if these patients tolerated the drug. There's a lot of things we don't know, but I, I think it's fair to say that it's at least encouraging that there might be something there with this therapeutic option for our patients. I think it's an important way to think through the data. Thank you so much, Dr. Pogue, for that very thorough analysis. Um, and we always appreciate you taking the time to talk with Contagion. It's my pleasure. I love what you guys do.